Okay, before we start the video, I just wanted to thank Terra Sancta for being the very first channel sponsor and uh, giving us the opportunity to speak with Nader Mwadi of Mwadi Distillery in Palestine. He is a master Adak distiller and it was so, so cool to sit and speak with him. World Adak Day is the 27th of June, so making this video just in time. Without further ado, here's the video. Hi, I'm Jazz. I'm a bartender. This is Very Good Drinks. I get really obsessed over things and my latest obsession has been Adak. Adak is a wine-based spirit that is flavored with anise. <clears throat> Dating back to the 9th century, the history of Adak actually starts with the history of spirits. Spirits themselves start in sort of a scientific manner. There are these Arabic scholars who are busy creating algebra and chemistry, but at the same time, they are distilling things. It wasn't meant for drinking. Uh, in fact, they were mostly Muslim and, and drinking is not really permitted. All these people all around the world are fermenting. Everybody has their own fermented beverages, but the pot still and distillation start to seep out around the world and eventually where we start getting spirits from other parts of the world. Fast forward, Arak is a huge part of the agricultural cycle in this region. You know, the grape harvest happens and then the wine gets made and then later on it gets turned into Arak and nothing ever gets wasted and it's just part of this yearly cycle. It's like a circle. This circle of grape life, this grape circle, this crop circle, <laughs> This agricultural cycle goes on for many, many years undisturbed until, of course, our best friend, colonialism, shows up and completely changes the whole game. After the Ottomans were toppled and the British and, and the French came to the region, they divided the region into spheres of influence. And Syria and Lebanon became French colonies, while the southern countries of Levant, Jordan, Palestine, as well as Iraq, became British colonies. The French, actually, they very much supported home distillation and winemaking in general. To them, you know, they were saying that, you know, we want to tax these people. The more products and exports they can make, the more we can tax. And they already had this rich history of winemaking and distillation. The British had a more sophisticated taxation system. And they decided that what they would do is they would completely outlaw home distillation. And if you wanted to distill, you needed to have a licensed distillery. The Arabs were already very used to evading taxes from colonial empires. So it was very easy for them to evade, you know, taxation from the British. And they were doing home distillation in the mountains and selling Arak and things were carrying on business as usual, unhindered for more than a thousand years. It was after the British left and when, you know, these governments began to form their own governments made up of the people that really home distillation was completely uprooted because the people in government were from the people and they themselves practiced tax evasion. So they were no longer alien, they were indigenous. And they knew the tricks of the trade and they yeah. knew how people were doing things. And they completely crushed it. They were essentially cut off from the tradition of home distillation, which they practiced for almost a thousand years. And now, a hundred years later, most people, they have no relationship to distilling. It's no longer part of their history. Well, in Syria and Lebanon, home distillation is still very abundant. And almost every house in like the rural countryside will have a still in the barn and it's considered a piece of rural agricultural equipment like a tractor or a plow. But the southern provinces, like Palestine, Jordan, and Iraq, it's, they don't at all have that. It's, it's really very much centered in, in monopolies or duopolies. And you can imagine when there's little competition, you know, uh, it's not in the benefit of the consumer, let's say. I want to talk about how Arak was traditionally made and how that's changed over time. Arak is made with grapes. Those could be white grapes, they could be red grapes. They're distilled, and at that second distillation, usually, it's sort of like a grappa. The third distillation is really where the money happens. Like, that's, that's where the majority of the flavor comes in when you add the anise. After talking to Nader, it was super interesting to learn that the terroir, or sort of the essence of the arak itself, doesn't actually come from the grapes. The grapes kind of provide the base. The anise is actually where most of the tawar and the intricacies and subtleties of the arak actually come from. There's only one species of anise. There's one 
one species called Anisum pimpinella, and it's only grown in the Mediterranean basin. Anisol is one of 85 different flavonoids in the herbal essential oil of anise. So it's a very complex herbal essential oil. Anise is very reactive to terroir. The composition of those 85 flavonoids differs drastically from country to country, depending upon soil composition, depending upon rainfall, uh, average temperature, uh, all these things that come into play to really um, create a unique flavor for the anise profile. And I would say that there's generally two categories of addicts. There's some addicts that are more vegetal, and there's other addicts that are more sweet and candy-like. So if you want to make a Palestinian addict, it would be essential that you use a Palestinian uh, anise. Like it's not in the grapes, it's more so in the anise itself. During the third distillation, the anise is added, and it's left to age usually six months to a year. And traditionally that would have been done in clay amphora. This is the time where the anethol, which is the essential oil of the anise, has time to become solvent into the alcohol itself. And it takes time for the oil and the solvent to actually become one. This is what is undone whenever you add water to arak and creates that cloudy louche effect. The oil separates out of solution and the light can actually reflect off of that and it creates this kind of milky cloudy thing. This sort of leads us into what Arak is today. And from there you had the birth of conventional Arak. So now I would say you have two types of Araks. We have conventional Arak, which is usually produced from uh, a ready prepared uh, distillate, which is usually from another agricultural origin other than grapes. In most cases it's usually sugar cane or corn or sugar beets. Um, some of them use anise seed, but most use anise flavoring because they, they get the herbal essential oil already distilled. Some of them, they mix it and distill it together. Some people, they mix it. Some people include other uh, similar aromatics like licorice or fennel. And because there is no oversight over what is arak, people have this freedom to do what they want. Traditional arak and conventional arak, these are made up terms. There's actually nothing protecting the spirit. There's, there aren't any rules, there's no government regulation like you would have with bourbon or with mezcal saying this is how you make it, you have to follow these processes in order for it to be called arak. It's sort of the wild west and I thought that Nader had a really interesting take on the PDO for arak. Now we don't have any protected designations uh, regarding arak. I don't blame the producers at all. I think the Arak is a victim to conflicts, or political turmoil. This whole region, essentially, whether it's Iraq or Palestine or Syria or Lebanon, it's been one conflict after the other. Where there's political turmoil and conflict, there's poverty. And where there's poverty, people tend to focus on buying only essential goods. So people tend to focus on medicine, food, shelter. And the Arak is a non-essential item. And to make authentic Arak, it's very expensive to produce. So people had to find more modern ways to make Arak in the post-industrial revolution in a way that's cost-effective for the masses. If they can't, then they have to close down shop, then Arak would disappear all, altogether. So that was the ultimatum, was either stop producing Arak or find ways to make it you know, more cost-effective. People have this freedom to do what they want. And at the end of the day, each business you know, went their own route and did their own way of making things more cost effective. It's not the fault of those, of those companies. And at the end of the day, businesses, they're, okay, they're driven by profits, but ultimately the people behind those businesses, they want to put food on the table and they have families and, and businesses are livelihoods. The conventional Arak, I mean, it, it, even though it's, it's palatable and, and, and the masses drink it, and it's, it's by far the majority of what is produced today and the majority of what is consumed today. So there is a large market for it. I, I don't think it's comparable with the traditional Arak, but a lot of people were led to believe that this is traditional Arak. And a lot of people didn't like it. And those who didn't like it abandoned that. And in, in making it cost effective, they managed to make it available for the masses, but those who had money tended to gravitate towards other spirits, finer spirits, etc. And and they really left the Arak behind. And now, unfortunately, if you go into any liquor store, you have to search for the Arak shop. It's somewhere down below your knees in a corner. And the Arak took on this um, this stigma of being the poor man's drink, a drunkard's drink, the drink you drink to get you know bumped on a budget. It's not the gifts that you would bring with you if you're in someone's house for a special occasion. And it's unfortunate because it's our national spirit. We should take pride in it. And it has a very specific purpose and where it fits in our, our culinary heritage. Basically, due to colonialism, we were separated from the craft. When we got separated from the craft, 
again, people began to abandon this uh, post-industrial revolution version of it. And now I think people are starting to rediscover it. And hopefully we can create a uh, a Arak revival. The traditional way to serve Arak is you pour about one-third Arak and two-thirds cold water into a glass. It becomes this milky, opalescent white color. You would enjoy Arak with water and it becomes this sort of palate cleanser in between bites of all of your meze or small plates. Nader uh, kind of explains this better than I can. When you eat like a Palestinian meal or Lebanese or Syrian meal, like there's all a bunch of just like 20 plus dishes on the table and each one has like a contending flavor profile. One might be zesty, one might be fiery, one might have like a mommy flavor profile. We rip pita bread and we take like little dips and bump, you know, jump in from one dish to the other. If you were to dive into one dish right into the other, you'd be stacking those flavors in your palate. So for Arak, it's sort of like a transitional drink that cleanses the palate. So when you jump into one dish, you reset your palate, then you go to the other dish and you get the full flavor out of it. At the same time, it has a natural sweetness, so it offsets all of the flavors on the table. So it works as a counterbalance, and it's that because it counterbalances everything, it kind of brings like like uniformity to this otherwise chaos that you have going on in the table. So that's sort of like how it fits with our cuisine. My head's spinning. I've learned so much about Arak. Uh, I hope you have learned a little bit about Arak as well, but this is a cocktail channel, so I wanted to talk about Arak and cocktails. If you've never had Arak before, it's like licorice candy, I'd say. Yeah, really fresh, bright. They're also really uh, potent. They're really similar to a lot of other anise spirits throughout the world. Some notable ones are Italian Sambuca, uh, Greek Ouzo, um, Pastis, even um, the green one. Absinthe? Absinthe. I think that that's a great place to start. Anywhere you would use an absinthe, then you can reasonably substitute this. Um, it's going to be slightly different, obviously. We talked about like the kind of similarities between Arak and like say absinthe, even the absinthe with the luching and all that. There's also Batavia Arak. We have Arak and then Arak with two R's is the Batavia Arak. Uh, in other parts of the world, they kind of use the term Arak interchangeably with like spirit. So. That's that. Batavia Arak is made from typically sugar cane, but it can be made with like coconut blossoms and other things. I think this could work really well in kind of like tiki style drinks. Maybe like a Mediterranean twist on a Sazerac would be really cool. Today I'm going to be playing off of like a Mediterranean lemonade type of situation. Orange flower water. So we're just gonna add like a drop or two. That's probably good. And that's gonna add like a nice sweet floral flavor. The drink itself is gonna be pretty easy. It's all equal parts, so one ounce of each thing. And we're gonna start with grenadine, pomegranate grenadine. This is our uh, very good grenadine recipe. Don't know why I'm holding it like this, but that's okay. So it's gonna give us a nice pomegranate base and some sweetness. This also has just a little bit of rose water in it as well, so it's gonna add even more of that like kind of floral vibe. Got some super lemon juice here. We're gonna do one ounce. Get a nice balance. We're not gonna add the arak into the tin because we wanna get some like color changing vibes, you'll see. So I'm just gonna shake up the grenadine and lemon first. Cool. I'm gonna add one ounce of soda. Yeah, let's add a little bit more soda. I am using this Ramala because it's a little more affordable and it has a very like candy-like, licorice-y sort of vibe to it. The anise, obviously not licorice. Well, this one is really, really nice, and I would feel bad putting it in a cocktail. It's, it's really nice to just drink by itself. There's a lot of nuance, and I think it would just get lost in a cocktail like this. So I'm just gonna have some respect and, and leave it for uh, sipping, and this is just going to be our cocktail arak. This is 100 proof. It's pretty damn strong stuff. So I'm just gonna be adding one ounce of the arak, and we should get a cool kind of luching effect. Yes, sick. Yeah. So for garnish, I'm just gonna add a nice 
the lemon expression on the top. Just gonna be super fresh summer vibes. I feel like this is like a perfect sort of like summer picnic, making kebabs, having a good old time type of drink. And there we have it. So obviously this is cool for serving, but I gotta give it a good mix before we drink. What a cool color. Let's try it out. Super aromatic, super fresh, very bright, light. I mean, it just makes me happy. Yeah, that's fucking bomb. It's a slimer. Very refreshing, sweet, aromatic. You definitely get the Adak. I feel like it's more, it's less like licorice -y and more just like fresh and herbal. It's super great. But yeah, I hope you try it out. I wanted to thank everyone for watching. If you got to the end, thank you so much. Please like and subscribe and go find some Arak at your local liquor store. After learning all that I have about Arak, I just have such a soft spot for it. I have grown to respect it and appreciate it so much more. It deserves to be respected. It deserves to be preserved. It deserves to be enjoyed. It deserves to be shared. It deserves to be pushed forward. And if this spirit speaks to you, whether you grew up around it or not, then maybe uh, you can be part of this journey into making Arak what it deserves to be. I think that it's a really beautiful spirit and it represents a really beautiful part of not only the history of that part of the world, but the history of cocktails and spirits in general. I am super thankful to uh, everyone watching as well as Terra Sancta and especially Nader for sharing his joy and passion for the spirit with me and with all of us. As a Mexican American, I felt this way about Mezcal in the past and diving into what makes that spirit great and understanding how much it means that people around the world respect it now. I think that it would be so fucking cool and beautiful if that same mentality was put forth towards Arak. And I just wanted to say that it's a really cool thing and you should check it out and we should drink more Arak. Cheers.